You know, that first smell of rain is telling you, okay, this is the best part of the year. And I think that, you know, there's still those sorts of links to soil, to our past, that are inherent with our, within our genetic. And, and, you know, most gardeners are like that. They need to get out in the soil and smell it and be part of it. And I think that that's something that is missing in for a lot of people in our society. They don't have that link to nature. It's so important. It's so important psychologically for people to have that link. That was Dr John Grant, and you're listening to The Regenerative Journey. From wherever we are, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, recognising their continuing connection to this land, its waterways, the stars in the skies since time immemorial. We pay our respects to the elders, knowledge holders and to all the generations of First Nations peoples who have nurtured their unceded sovereign lands for over 80,000 years and continue to do so today. G'day, I'm your host Charlie Arnott, an 8th generational Australian regenerative farmer and in this podcast series I'll be diving deep and exploring my guests' unique perspectives on the world so you can apply their experience and knowledge to cultivate your own transition to a more regenerative way of life. Welcome to The Regenerative Journey with your host Charlie Arnott. G'day and welcome back to The Regenerative Journey. This week's episode is with Dr. John Grant and I'm going to chat about him in a minute. Firstly, I just want to announce, and this is coming to you on the 15th, if my calculations are correct, and I've got my timing right, 15th of August, which is the day before the 16th of August, funnily enough, and it's the 16th of August at our webinar series, our Regenerative Agriculture Mastery Series, uh, Farm Smarter, Not Harder, is launching on the 16th with Nicole Masters. Now, if you don't know Nicole, go back to previous, a couple of episodes ago. Nicole Masters, the global expert in soil, the soil siren, we like to call her. Um, she's now living in Montana. But she's kindly joined us um, to kick off. She was only available. She's very busy. And we're very grateful that she's been able to give us some time on the 16th of August <clears throat> to kick off our our uh, Regenerative Agriculture Mastery uh, webinar series uh, that you can get tickets on. It's still not too late. Um, you can even get them after the thing starts. But if I was you, I'd get them now before the thing starts. You will be able to get recordings of it and some uh, um, and various resources and information and intel throughout the webinar series. But get on charlieanna.com.au and go to Farm Smarter, Not Harder, uh, to get your tickets. And you may or maybe not, well, hopefully you are lucky enough to, um, if there's any, some, some tickets left for our farm tour on the 13th of August, uh, 13th of August, bow, bow, 13th of October. We are uh, we're offering a, uh, a plus one ticket for that as well. Um, they may have already sold out by now, but get on board and join us here at Hannah Minow on the 13th of October. Stuart Andrews, Cherie Gooding, uh, Kim Deans, I think is going to get along as well. Um, Hamish Mackay, we're going to have a, fe- a feast. Uh, and a whole lot of demonstrations, chats, presentations on the day, uh, as well as a farm tour. So get on board that. Yeah, regenerative agriculture, master your journey to sustainable farming success. Get your tickets. Now, uh, one last thing too, talking about launching things, my, my, <laughs> my hope is that our little planes, our Airbnb uh, offering, it's a beautiful 1927 built uh, Federation Homestead, just over the road from Hannah Minow here. That's part of our our um, our our holdings here. It is a beautiful property and a wonderful homestead that we've spent a whole lot of time uh, getting ready for you to um, to rent. It sleeps twelve, five bedrooms. Um, it's awesome. Um, beautiful setting. There's an orchard out the back. We're going to throw some chickens in there and all sorts of complimentary things and showcase some uh, wonderful products their own and from the hilltops area so get on charlieart.com.au forward slash farm stay book your stay um if i was you burua and for those who don't know burua wool fest is on the october long weekend i'm not sure what day that actually is but look up burua um, uh, october long weekend that is a time to visit burua and stay at little plains it's big it's big enough to sort of have a couple of families there too so if you want to um go for a little retreat it might be a business retreat um 
with your fa- your your buddies, your um, uh, your business buddies. Uh, we can accommodate you. We can also supply different things and meet your um, requirements, whether it be food or suggested suggested things to do out and about. Um, we could do a farm tour potentially as well um, for those who stay, and that just isn't a business retreat. That can be families and so on. That could be something we could offer, but we'd have to talk about that off the line just to make sure the timing works and we're available to do that. So there it is, Little Plains, a beautiful Angelica, I have to say, has done an amazing job, and all the team here because we've all had hands in it, driving tractors and trucks and picking stuff up and chopping things down and moving things around. It's been monumental, but it tell you what, it looks magnificent. Little Plains, check it out, charlianet.com.au forward slash farm stay and stay on our farm. Um, John Grant, what a lovely bloke. He's a classic. He, I tell you what, if there's anyone, it's a bit, he's a, is he a bit like Walter Yena? Different personalities, but they still have this beautiful knack of making something that could potentially be pretty boring soil as exciting, well, as as amazing as soil is. It can be pretty dry, not not literally. Well, it can be, of course, but in terms of um, how it's taught, it could it can be a pretty dry topic. I know it was at school, at school, uh, university. But John, just like Walter, has a wonderful knack of bringing life and color to soil um, through his experiences with it through. His teaching, his lecturing. Dr. John has, um, he's been um, part of the team at uh, Southern Cross University for many years. And I met John um, working with him and Brunswick Valley Land Care um, up there. Um, Peter Ryan, you, buddy, um, legend that you are, um, working with Pete and, uh, and John and a few others up there talking about soil, agriculture uh, in the Northern Rivers. We looked at macadamias, we looked at soil, we looked at um, cattle, we looked at all sorts of cool stuff in over a sort of a three-day period in a week. And John was just, he just brought so much colour and enthusiasm and, and kind of, you know, just good content, um, relevant content to the conversation, as he does in this interview with John. And I brought up with him in his home in the Northern Rivers of New South Wales. And he is an absolute, he, he's such a, um, how do I, how, I, he's probably going to listen to this, so I won't bang, I won't pump his tyres up too much. But lovely bloke, we had such a, such a laugh. Such a good, um, a good. Sometimes when you're having, having such a good convo, you forget you're actually doing an interview. But um, uh, we danced around the conversation um, beautifully for for a good while, and um, really lovely to spend some time with John. And uh, I hope you enjoy this episode, this interview, this yarn, this conversation with John Grant, Doctor John, on the regenerative journey. And then what I what I like to do, John, is start the recording and then keep talking and my guest generally doesn't know that I'm talking. <coughs> but you do. I've, I've, given, yeah, I've, given, given, it I've given it on the game away. And you can drink tea. I just don't want to shake the table and you I know. Know, sort of go through. Spill. The last thing I want to do is spill my tea on this very smart bit of gear. Well, I'm, I'm more concerned that it's going to, every time we put the tea down, you're going to get this shaking. Oh, no, it'll be fine. Oh, I'm there? Yeah, no, I'm that's there. all part of the that's all part of the user experience. That'll be fine. <laughs> John Grant. Welcome to the regenerative journey, and welcome to the um, what do you call veranda patio out terrace? This is Queensland. We call this Queensland because that's New South Wales in the centre. This is Queensland, a bit warmer, a bit further north. Ah. Victoria is the entrance. Oh, yeah, I came through there. Yeah, that one, that's yeah, the Northern Territory just there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then South Australia, I love it. the little one where, uh, well, South Australia's the little one over there where, <laughs> where the table tennis is, and then we've got Western Australia, the big, big one. The veranda out, out the there, other where side. We, where we go for a crap. <laughs> <laughs> That's not saying anything about our West Australia. Our, um, what are they? What are they? They've got crow eaters in South Australia, and um, what are they? Uh, is it sand? No. Yeah, yeah. Can't, can't, sandpipers. No. no. What, that, what's WA? I'm sorry, uh, WA listeners. Yeah, yeah. Sand. Um, oh, no, isn't the, the AFL, they, they call them the, no, that's a free man doctor, that's not even an animal. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I get what you're saying, <coughs> cane, the cane toads up here and the cockroaches. Yes, yes. Um, and the, the crow eaters. <clears throat> well, John, thank you for um, finally, because we had a few false starts, didn't we? I remember I texted you, said, oh, can we do it? And it didn't happen. And I'm glad we're in your garden. And your veranda here in Queensland because um, we're not actually in Queensland, are we? We're in the Northern Rivers of New South Wales at an undisclosed address. <laughs> I wouldn't want anyone to Come here and take it. I want my students to chase me down. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> I'm sure we'll get to that. I'm sure there's a few stories there. Um, but we um, uh, we're in. Well, I, I mean, I, I I've always done face to face interviews because I like the that that for, forum of you know um, having a chat. And in in my guess, hopefully they're happy place. Well, yeah. Are we in your happy place, John? Yeah, yeah. I think this is my happy place. This is. Uh, I've been here for a while. Changed the environment, created the environment to suit us. Um, but yeah, it's a. I mean, this is, it's interesting that you become. I think you become part of your place, and you, and how your how land affects you, how it impacts upon your personality, and how your personality impacts upon it. I think it's a really inter- interesting conversation, and uh, you can sort of a. Well, I'm, and I, sh- I guess I should say that this this land here is Wichita Wible. Uh, country. This is um, part of the great Bundjalung nation, and uh, uh, and this you know this is unceded land. So we're we're incredibly fortunate to be on this beautiful patch of land and have that massive history of Aboriginal uh, land management behind us. Um, that's why it's such a uh, unspoiled place, or it was unspoiled until we got here. But um, hopefully, we can draw on some of that. Aboriginal knowledge, First Nations knowledge on land management because we're sure as hell going to need it over the next couple of decades. Del. <laughs> no, that's fine. We love dogs. We love dogs barking. <laughs> I, had, I did an interview um, last year, John, and um, a fellow called David Carter, and <clears throat> the dog must have bumped something and half the table. Oh, that was like a little, a very, very like a. Um, uh, tiny little outdoor table, and the whole thing fell over. Well, it's just about. It was in the middle. It was a classic. Um, <clears throat> that's a really good. I, I'm, I'm glad we we we've jumped on that one, and we can. I'd like to probably go back to it, but it is. Do you know of you know v- local, as in very local, any history that um you're you're aware of? I mean, I'm just looking at that beautiful um big tree just there. You know, I always see them and those sizes. I'm not sure how. I mean, I think they're really well. I don't know how many how many years old that would be, but I always think, oh, that was. You know, is it a grandmother tree? Is it one of the? Is it was it a significant spot? Was it planted? You know, I'm always curious about. You know, what did this look like 240 years ago? Yeah, yeah, and and I mean, this sort of this part of the world, it, it changes so quickly, so and things grow so quickly here. So that tree up there that we're looking at is actually a camphor. That was probably oh, a camphor. Yeah. Oh, my mistake. Really, it's, it looks. It's got the. I guess it's the roots. It's just enormous. Uh, and you've got a. What you've got is a um, strangle fig. Starting oh, to I'm grow seeing the roots it. of that. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm with you. So it's the next generation taking over. Yeah. Uh, so I guess those camphor trees were planted. I think probably around about the 60s, 40, 50s. Not that long ago. Not that oh they're, yeah they're fast growing trees in this environment, and they've come to dominate. But that would have been a mother tree, yeah. That all the campers that are around here have come from original plantings kind of thing. Yeah, so this was when they thought camper was a great idea because they are they're beautiful trees, they're amazingly beautiful trees, great shade trees, quite uh, quite tough. They do handle cattle and provide shade, um, so yeah, they were quite a a good utility tree. It's just in not many places the seeds are viable and they spread everywhere with birds. And mm. this is one of those places. <clears throat> they love it here, don't they? They do, and they just spread very quickly. But there'd be there'd be probably quite a few people who would be horrified to hear you say that they're a good tree and they're they're you know just putting uh, a positive positive spin on it. I think. Uh, I mean, I yeah. Uh, uh, people have different perspectives. It, ha- it probably has provided, I mean, because they do have the fruit, and we do have a lot of fruit-eating uh, birds that are from the original rainforest, and they have been surviving on some of these introduced species. So it's probably kept some of those species going until we've sort of started to reintroduce some of the native flora. So it, they, they're good and bad to it. Mm. Um, and that they provide protection uh, from erosion, they tie the soil together. So that there's uh, yeah, positive and negative to them. I guess that's a <clears throat> just we're segueing, but that's cool. We tend to do that. 
Um, the, you know, people go, oh, bloody camp, I caught I poison, I cut them down, they come back and yada, yada, but I, it might be also combined with, you know, the the fact or the characteristic is like it's just covered, trying to cover the soil, isn't it? Mm. It's like going, okay, well, you've just made a bear. What else am I going to do? Sit here and do nothing. I'm going to germinate or I'm going to grow. I'm going to come back again. <clears throat> so I guess it's, it's, there's no um, removing them is, and, and, and leaving it. There's that is is certainly not the not the um, for those who need or want to remove them. Um, that's not necessarily just the simple way to go, is it? There's there's a whole lot more going on in that little microclimate than just. Yeah, and they're a default successional species. So, so they're a, a primary successional species. They come into a, a landscape that has been, uh, well, let go, I guess, that is no longer used for primary production. This, all this country around here used to be dairy farms. So it was pretty open, was it? This was all open. This whole really? valley was open not really? that long ago. There wasn't a tree in this valley. And you can look back to the, some of the aerial photos from the 1940s and there virtually wasn't a tree in this valley, yeah. um, but it's just grown so rapidly. So, these have been are these are these been um, yeah you know, some been planted or it's just been like it's just done its own thing. It's things are germinated and yep. done, holes have been filled. It's done its own <laughs> thing. So you had a couple of these big uh, campers that were planted in rows, so you can see them pretty well where they were established. Had, these this camper here is the same age as three or four that are down at the school. Big trees and they've produce millions of seeds that have gone throughout the valley. And, and once you get mm. cattle off this country, then the, those trees start to establish. While you've got cattle on, it keeps the weeds out, looks up, keeps the camphor down, keeps the lantana down. But as soon as you take cattle off, it's just so productive, this country. Um, so, yeah, very quickly, post, you know, when the, the dairies collapsed, um, you could no longer get make money out of dairying this this property that we're on here. It was probably cleared in the early nineteen hundreds, and dairy was established. Then we probably only had two generations before the dairy industry collapsed. So, and at that stage, you know, people probably at the sixties, and people started uh, sp- cutting up these dairy farms. So this is now this. The dairy that this was part of is now four, I think, four properties. So Mm. quite small properties, too small to be a viable farm. I mean, it must have been tough country to farm in the first place. As soon as you get off the top of the ridge here, you get straight into uh, slopes of 45 degrees. It's just cliff. Down here. Yeah. (gasps) So, you know, real problems trying to um, control your cattle, but trying to control erosion on such steep slopes. And, of course, mm-hmm. they were forced to clear this country. Uh, you know, if you... It was part of a sort of like an open up the country, in- yep. industry, milk, you know, yep. Pro- yep. produce. Yep, and if you, you know, the, 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 if you wanted to settle some of these places, it, you had to clear the country in order to keep that piece of land as your own. That was a government decree. didn't have any choice. Were they, were they this like soldier settlement? No. 40 acre, 100 acre? Yeah, so this would have been about 100 acres, yeah, originally, mm. which is probably you know, viable for, in those days when you're running 30 or 40 cows, and that was sufficient. Nowadays where you have to run, well, what do you have to run? Well, that's it, man. That's the interesting question, isn't it? It depends on which way you're learning. Like some would argue conventional dairy, you need hundreds and hundreds, you know, scale. And then I hear stories of and know a few people who are back to, 15, 25 cows making good coin because they're value adding. You know, there's a whole. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, the middle is probably, in between that is probably the grey areas like, oh, not quite big enough to do this and too small to do that. Yeah, no, there's, and there's people that are making that decision to go small <laughs> mm. and and getting, and they're not, they get rid of that huge capital investment in mm. um, in machinery and in um, labor. feed and labour. Yeah, yeah and, they're, and they're doing quite well. And they're doing quite well, well, reasonably well financially, but I think they're doing quite well um, psychologically. They haven't got that stress and the pressure. And they're feeling like they're actually making, they're going forward, their farm is improving. You know, they're, they're, they're not lo- no longer seeing the, the paddocks that are um, not producing because they're compacted and overworked. So I think that, that it does make a difference, but it's a hard road to hoe. 
Mm. Um, so some of those, there's guys around here that are absolutely amazing who are, you know, the, the people that are leading the pack. But it's a tough thing to go to. It's a start. It's be the first one. Um, uh, there's a great guy that I used to take the students out to just on, you know, uh, only about 30K, 30 k's from here. And he always talked about, so he'd always talk. So I take the students out there, and of course the students. This guy, he was a real farmer, mm-hmm. and they were really excited to to hear him talk about. Um, oh well, you know, you, what, where do you guys buy your milk? You know, if you buy two dollar milk, that means I'm not planting up the creek along here because he's been doing a lot of work protecting the Wilson River. Um, and he was saying, but the pressure is, you know, the economic pressure comes from supermarkets pressing out, pressing our Price down, so you have to think about that. But anyway, he was, he was, he always, I'll go out there and I'd say, Well, how things are going? He'll say, Oh, the elephants are going really well. I said, Oh, elephants, the elephants, yeah. And and I'd say, Uh, I think, Oh, Dave, David, you're losing it. I was (laughs) thinking to myself, (laughs) and I'd say, No, but what about the cattle? He said, I'm not interested in the cattle, I'm just feeding the elephants. And I said, Oh, right. He said, Yeah, the the, the underground elephants, and he was right. So the microbiology underground, the invertebrates, is the equivalent of about five elephants per hectare. And he says, if I feed the elephants, if I make sure that there's healthy pasture that's returning uh, carbohydrates below ground, then that, then that will feed the, my cows. My cows are secondary. I need to feed the elephants first, and everything else will look after itself. It was a great story, and I know people, the students were just, you know, stunned by this. But it made them realise the importance of what was going on below ground. Because, you, you, of course, you walk onto a farm like that and they're looking straight at the cattle, not realising that all the activity they should be concerned about is going on below ground, not above ground. And you sort of think about it. I mean, there's a great, there was a great study up at UNE where they looked at the below ground biota in terms of biomass and up in that country up there you might be getting about, running about 20 sheep to the acre. Now, they looked at the below ground biota, and I think you had about the equivalent of about 10 sheep per hectare in invertebrates, in the invertebrates, but the microbiology was another 90 sheep per hectare. So you had 100 sheep per hectare in biomass below ground, but people were always looking at the top of what's above ground what you're, and thinking that's a measure of the... Um, success of your farming, whereas the below ground is what's driving the above ground. I mean, this is, of course, there's nothing new to you. This is just, or to your listeners. <laughs> but it's just, I think it just bears worth repeating. It's worth repeating because uh, I still can't. I, I, every time I say that, I still, it takes me, it, it just sort of reminds me of the importance of that below ground world. And because we're above ground, we forget all that. You know, we've got a very above ground focus when the vast majority of of uh, micro of animals and plants in the world they're they're below ground. We've got a very uh, minority view looking at the above ground world. I mean, it's a nice world down there. Well, we're going to get to that too because I know your <clears throat> your head's been in there for. A, I've literally seen you in saw pits, so you 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 you're you're quite the subterranean <laughs> dweller. Yeah. dweller. Um, and it's true, and I love that. I, I, I can't remember if I've heard the elephant sort of analogy before, but, uh, you know, certainly the comparison of, you know, you've got, li- you've got livestock above the ground and livestock below the ground, and, and one, the underground is so – well, the above ground is contingent on the health and the population, you know, and there's some relate, you know, relationship, dare I say, um, correlation <clears throat> in, in, you know, in terms of population of above and, and below – um, which is, as you say, it's it's about <clears throat> it's a story about focus, isn't it? You know, if we're focusing above ground, we're not looking at the we're not feeding the the goose, the golden goose, you know, <clears throat> and and we're just thinking, oh, we want we want these eggs, but we're if we're if we're and I, I love that the idea that the <clears throat> that the the cattle <clears throat> or the or the the product or or the 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 output of the above ground is is absolutely contingent on our <clears throat> focus and nurturing and and management <clears throat> as we can, you know, control um, of the of the below ground yeah, um, yeah. population. 
Yep, absolutely. John, um, I want to take. Oh, I just want to touch on your backyard because you said a great thing there when we came out here that it's it's kind of a any. I think and, and you're right. <clears throat> anyone's backyard, and I did an interview last Friday out in Narrabri, it was a very similar thing was said. It's like <clears throat> you know about, about well, what you you say how you said your backyard is kind of a, a mix of things, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. We're looking. We're looking at. And I can't tell what you know what causes you pleasure or pain out there. I can kind of probably work it out, but. <laughs> yes. Well, it's sort of your happy place because you know that, like, there's lots of stuff that you've done here, and you you know the history of, and you're linked to. But there's also stuff that you know you want to do or you should have done. You know, there's trees that need. I, you know, I'm looking up there and I'm seeing. Oh, gee, that tree needs to come out. It's gonna. It's just getting too big, and it's not a tree. It's not a not a local native. And which one's that? Oh, that one behind the gravillia. Yeah, yeah, that that um, orchid over there, orchid tree. So not really what I what I want there, and he's getting a bit too big. Um, Is that a myrtle there? That one, that yeah. shiny bark one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah. Is that, a, is that a native? Is that a rainforest native up here? No, no, it isn't a rainforest no. native. I mean, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm not overly, I'm not anti-native species. Only those that I, I do have a concern about the nectar of that orchid tree there. Really, nectar. Yeah, I don't think it's good for the bees, someone yeah, right. said. Yeah. So, but, but, yeah, so I just sort of want to choose my species carefully. So, yeah, there's just a, always a bit to do. And I think that, you know, this part of the world is um, on the northern rivers. I don't think I've ever quite, well, I'm not from here, so I've never quite prepared for how uh, burdened it is. How, mm. <laughs> like, it's just, it just doesn't, doesn't stop. No. You know, you get a couple of uh, months in the middle of the year and in sort of you know, winter when things slow down. I remember going down to the south coast after being up here and, and uh, um, my, par- uh, my partner's cousin had bought a place down on the south coast. And I said, oh, and she had, got, had a few acres there. And I was saying, well, how do you manage this? And she said, oh, I'll just get someone to slash. And I said, oh, okay, okay that, that's pretty busy. And she said, no, once a year. <laughs> like, not to slash here every three weeks. <laughs> and you don't obviously have any cattle to kind of keep that under no, control. No, no, and that's sort of, sort of, you know, I sort of wish that I'd, I'd um, made the time to get fencing. And I mean, it's just it's just such a, such a small block that um could have only probably run one or two, and then you've got to have yards and yeah. you know it's a bit of a thing and skill. You know, you have to have skills too. You know, I'm a bit nervous about it. The, the, the skills that you need to, to uh, look after cattle. I mean, we used to have cattle when we were kids, but, um, and it seemed much easier then. <laughs> oh, it's still in your blood, John. <laughs> Talking about as kids, <clears throat> so let's go back. Um, we can. Go, I, I tend to take people back to their date. Their, not their date. We don't have to tell us that because then people <laughs> will start working out your age and all sorts of other things. <clears throat> your, though I did see an astrological calendar in your, your bathroom there, so that may be of some relevance. Um, the day the day of, um, of birth, where were you and, and what, what, what happened? I think that was the, when the Roman Empire collapsed. <laughs> <laughs> you look remarkably healthy for... <laughs> two, two centuries. <laughs> two <laughs> thousand year old. <laughs> yeah. Bloody saw, um, saw man. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I think, so I was born in, uh, I think my parents were between properties and we were actually had a few, might have had 12 months uh, at Woi Woi. Woi Woi on the central, no, yeah, what are they called, the central, central coast, coast, yeah. I was actually born uh, at New South Gosford Wales. Oh, yeah. I've got a couple of older brothers who were born in Leeton. Um, and then, so that's where my, my dad came from. So his family had a couple of properties there, and then he sold up. Must have been after his dad died, and then so they had a number of properties there, mostly stone fruit and citrus, little places, very little, small places. When they first cut up that part of the world, and they had quite small properties for and thought that people could survive on them. And you did okay, but you had to buy a couple of properties. So he, that, so he must have, so their family sort of owned a few properties and did pretty well through the, uh, through the Depression. If you, had, if you could grow your own food, you did okay during the Depression, but most of the other kids in that part of the world 
had it pretty tough. Mm. So they did pretty well, and then um, and then he sold the place or sold that place and moved in and was between properties when I was born, and then moved to a place at Braidwood. Oh yeah, they bought a place at Braidwood there. Just chasing you again. We had this conversation for those listening. We had this conversation before we kicked off that if I was to chase John around the his chair with the microphone, it was or oh, well, more more John saying if depending on his position or his or his the state of um, what was tension. it tension. <laughs> yeah. If you were tense, you'd be leaning forward. I have to move it away, or you got get a bit yeah, relaxed. No, so you right. look quite relaxed now. Well, that's right. I start it's like just starting telling people about my life. That's when people <laughs> start to get relaxed, like. So relaxed they go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> they won't. You just mentioned Braidwood. Everyone loves Braidwood. Braidwood's becoming quite the cool and ruby place to be now. Yeah, well, this was, it wasn't quite so cool. Well, it was bloody cool. Yeah. So we moved there for a few years uh, and had a sheep, uh, had sheep there. So we were down on the Shoalhaven and um, had another couple of brothers born there. You know, that, that, that was a pretty tough place in those days. Probably still is. Bloody cold. Mm. In winter and and hot and summer and dry, bloody dry. Um, but yeah, we had sheep there, and uh, I, yeah, um, I, we always had sheep growing up, really. Um, so and a few, I, you said a few brothers or siblings, yeah, yeah, so yeah. four brothers. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, so when we were at Braidwood, there we had, I think there were, so there was five boys under the age of six. Oh, <laughs> so really? You can imagine that. But wow. Yeah, for my parents, anyway, that would have been a shock to them. But yeah, we had no and no power, no power uh, down there on the river. But um, so, what would, did you? So no power, or you had a generator for power? Or no, 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 power? no, no, no power. power. You just had uh, you just boil up the copper to do the washing, um, and yeah, yeah, had wood for the stove and lanterns. Wow, people are going to think you're two thousand years old. <laughs> That's incredible. So that was in the when, just to give us a sense of. Time. So that was sort of, uh, yeah, mid-60s, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and then, but, yeah, I guess that's, you know, I sort of got inculcated with the with sheep and the smell of sheep and shearing sheds and all that. In, in, and once it's sort of in your blood, it never gets out of your blood. I mean, uh, where the stories, so I was in shearing sheds from, from as soon as I could walk, basically. And um, I remember the... the Shearers used to call me belly wool because that was my job. I'd get the belly wool. <laughs> hey, belly wool, over here. <laughs> there was one story there, and one of the shearers said, Hey, and yelled out to me, Dad, hey, the sheep, the, the sheep are out. Someone's left the gate open. And they looked over, and sure, sure enough, the, the gate into one of the yards was uh, open, but the sheep were going the wrong way. They couldn't work out. I, no, sheep never go the way that you want them to. Mm. And then that was only when, once the sheep were in that they realised there was this someone smaller than the sheep, which is me chasing them in. I noticed that what the, the pens were getting empty, so I went out and chased them in, filled up the pens to keep the shearers occupied. People. So you, you it was perfect timing. Yeah, yeah, we were, well, yeah, that was, I knew my job. Boom. Good on you, good on you, Billy Wool. That's a classic. <laughs> but I say, yeah, and then we sort of had sheep. They are, oh, but yeah, I think we were there. I mean, we. we we were there during the, a drought. There's always a bloody drought at Braidwood Day. Eh? It's a bit that, of a rain shadow there, I think, sometimes. Yeah. So I think that we, though any, I think, money that Dad had made uh, in those early years, so he didn't get married till his mid-40s, so he had sort of done an accumulated bit of wealth. Um, you know, he did pretty well, and of course, no... No expenses, so he'd accumulated a bit of money, and then a lot of that went at Braidwood, I think. Uh, and then we moved from there to to Tassie, Tasmania, where my mum had come from, and bought a property there. And we were there for quite a while. We ran sheep again, where whereas it's not real good sheep country; it's probably more cattle country. What part of Tassie? Up in the northwest, so pretty wet. Oh, yeah. Was that near Burnie or somewhere? Yep, yep, just south of Burnie, Burnie yep. around Wynyard. And then uh, it was wet. It was, quite, it was always wet there, you know. It's about the same rainfall as here, but it really? rained every day. 
Like and, just, and, and quite cold and bitter and, and windy up there, isn't it? Well, yeah, it gets windy. I mean, it never gets real cold. You get a bit yeah. of snow occasionally. In, in, but you get just get a bit of rain every day, all day. Like up here, your rain comes bang and then it, and then and it you, goes. But nice there, day, yeah. it's just continually rain. I remember one particularly wet year, we are going go and feed out the sheep, sheep in winter with hay that we'd uh, put away and and the, yeah, the wind you'd be throwing out the hay and you'd be blowing, blowing back in your face and, <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. And then we noticed after a while that the sheep had this green tinge to them. All the, the grass seed that was lodging oh. on in the wool was actually sprouting. Like when you put, yeah, like when you put wheat into a... Cotton, cotton, cotton wool, wool yes. thing. Oh, what a classic. They were walking, yeah, they've, they've, walking, barring um, pa- paddocks. Paddocks. Small paddocks. What so they classic. could just eat off each other's back, <laughs> theoretically. I mean, I wonder if that's you can set that up. <laughs> that's a great, wow, there you go. That's 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 like enterprise stacking, <laughs> the whole new meaning of enterprise stacking. But, yeah, wet country, cold, cold and wet. But, but, you know, beautiful country. A bit similar to this in terms of, the same soils, the same soil types. Really? So these same this is red ba- soils ba- basalt, on basalt. Yeah. Yep, yeah. Red soils on basalt. And there's not many places that you get these red soils on basalt. So I think But aren't red soils generally because of basalt? Like the basalt kind of parental rock, is that yeah, how it is a bit naive, maybe, but is that in the right condition, <clears> but there's <throat> lots of basalt that you that you get brown and black soils on. So once you get out okay. out west you you get um, dark soils on basalt. It's only where you get quite, well, historically or prehistorically high rainfalls that it, you get these red soils. There's not many patches of them. Is that because, like out west, <clears throat> um, the vegeta- like the organic matter sort of builds up because it's not being washed away or washed through like it is up here? Why? why? We've gone straight into soils. We've yeah, gone yeah, straight. Yeah. We've, we've taken half an hour, but that's good. We'll, we'll get back to... Um, Bernie, <clears throat> um, Tassie, but just let's go there while we're on it. Like, what's the difference? What? Why? It's fascinating. I, I, oh it's yeah, fascinating. yeah. You know, it is fascinating and tr- trying to understand where soils come from and what what makes them what they are and why they're different. And you know, so every soil is different on every part of the planet, which makes it um, makes it difficult to describe and research soils because there is always a bit of difference. So the on so basalt. Is a soil parent material that it's you know like our parents it creates the child which is soil, um, but then once the child is created, then it depends on the environment how it grows, and so for soils that um, so the basalt the parent material has a lot of nutrients um, or has the potential to supply a lot of nutrients, but in certain environments if you have quite high rainfalls. And warm conditions, tropical, subtropical conditions, then a lot of the nutrients are leached out of the soil and it also changes the mix of minerals that create clays. So you get a different set of clays present in high rainfall areas compared to lower rainfall areas. So once you, so we need these, this sort of environment where you've got lots of leaching, you get kaolinite clays and a hot, relatively high level of iron oxides present. Um, so you get these really special, these krasnozem or ferrosol, ferrosol soils, which have, have, fa- have fantastic structure and they're really sought after for horticulture. So in northwest Tassie, they're used for spuds and they're used for um, peas and various vegetable crops and they're also used for, um, oh, well, I mean, of course, the. Um, well, a lot of the flower flower uh, gardens, uh, commercial flower gardens, like the tulips on Table Cape, you might have seen some of those. Fantastic. Because they, they're the bulbs, I guess, and they get re- do they get replanted every year or they just stay there? They stay there, but <coughs> you, I think you do have to lift them and break them up and, and ex- oh, keep yeah. them healthy. <coughs> but, yeah, something like potatoes, you know, you can lift them up. I mean, they, they're great soils because physically they're quite fertile. You know, they're loose and friable, but they also hold, they're not like a sandy soil. Uh, they hold new water quite well and and supply water and allow deep rooting. Um, 
Whereas you get it into the drier areas, then you get a different clay forming. And at the extreme, you get those sh- you get shrink swell clays, the cracking. Oh, self-mulching. Kind of. Yeah, there's yeah, cracking right. and self-mulching clay. So, you know, big areas up around the Darling Downs and, um, you know, and down around Tamworth and those sorts of areas. Different climate, same parent material leads to quite a really different soil. Those soils out there, not as leached, chemically, more, much more fertile, but physically, not so fertile. I mean, they're much tougher to deal with. You, have, you know, they're much tougher to, to plant into and to cultivate. Um, a lot of that country was never used for cropping until you got big enough tractors to, to drag flowers through it and turn it over. So just so, that you, so chemically they're really fertile, is that what you said, but yep. physically not because of the structure? Yeah, the, and yeah, the, the structure's much tougher. <clears throat> That's and interesting to differentiate between... Chemical yeah, physics. Yeah, yeah, in terms of fertility, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so, I mean, these, these soils here, are, as I say, they're, they're physically fertile, and but they're not chemically fertile, particularly once you... So this, this was all subtropical rainforest on, on these... And there was a pretty close association between subtropical rainforest and these uh, red ferrosols in this part of the world. Um, and the tropic, subtropical rainforest was p- pumping tens or hundreds of tonnes of organic matter into the soil every year. They were highly productive and lots of organic matter going into the soil. The organic matter kept it fertile, provided fertility because the organic matter captured the plants captured nutrients, put them into organic matter, and that was cycled. Once you stop that cycle, then then these soils, which were initially uh, phys- chemically fertile, lost their chemical fertility but maintained their physical fertility. And then, you know, many of these dairy farms that were around here started to see relatively quickly after a couple of generations the fertility dropping off and starting to see productivity dropping off. I mean, there, there are records here of pH dropping from, you know, six down to four and a half in in six or seven years under intense uh, um, management. So th- these soils that, that appeared quite robust are not robust in terms of fertility. They're robust in terms of chemical fertility, but they're robust in terms of physical fertility. But So that meant the horticulturists still love these soils because you can come in, you can cultivate them well, they've got, the roots can penetrate well, they're well-drained. That's really a primary requirement of much horticulture, they're well-drained. You can add water, they don't dry out so too quickly. Um, so they're well-drained but also hold on to water. So they're not like a, a really sandy soil, so... And at the same time, you can add new. I mean, you can throw um, artificial fertilizers on. So you, you can, you can enhance the chemical fertility yeah. from as an input. Yeah, but you know that's. I mean, that, as, as we know, that's a difficult one to maintain uh, for decades without having impact upon our soil biology and you know adverse impacts upon the environment and and the soil biology. So it, 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 what appeared to be miraculous. Um, in the sort of 60s, once we started to do, uh, access fertile, artificial fertilisers and, and other pesticides and herbicides, it's sort of, we've, you know, and led to the Green Revolution, we've sort of started to realise, well, like most of these things, there is an adverse outcome that we hadn't bargained on. Um, back to, so was it the clearing of these, of the subtropical you know, vegetation was that was the beginning of the of the reduction in the in the, right. in the chemical fertility because it was the, the, that 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 function that functioning landscape and that that cycling was disturbed. Is that kind yeah. of yeah yeah? So you didn't have that big input of organic matter going into the soil. So once you lost that, <laughs> and particularly if you're you're pushing your farm hard, you're not allowing pastures to be. Pastures are, are good at inputting organic matter in the soils, but if you're pushing your pastures too hard, then that's not occurring either. Mm. Let's get back to we're going to be talk more soil because we just can't get away from it. But tell me more um, back to Tassie. So that you're in Tassie, 
Yes. Growing, growing, growing so, grass on sheep. Yeah. <laughs> it's clever. Yes. <laughs> A so, world first. So that was sort of, yeah, and then, I mean, we had sheep there. Um, uh, so it wasn't, that, of course, not, not, you can't really run fine wool, wool sheep when you've got um, rainfalls up around about 1,400 mils. Um, and then oh. some sheep, some cattle, uh, some beef cattle, but, it, you know, prices, that was sort of early 70s and oh, prices. Oh, cattle were cool. depression, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Pro- I mean, we probably picked the time really well. As most people do, you buy them high and <laughs> force and sell them low. See, that's happening now. That's happened in the last 12 months. I know. In the cattle industry. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Gee whiz. Just that even in the last couple of months, yeah. the price has really Dive. dropped out. Absolutely. Um, yeah, you, you think that you're sort of onto a good thing, but. And pull the rug out from under you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the and the and the the, the, the contributing factors. There's n- there's not the very there's not the clear line of sight. And 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 the interpretation and kind of the conclusions drawn or or even the kind of predictions of what's going to do. It's very hard nowadays because there's so many. There's international market pressure. There's, um, you know, like the, the midway midway through last year, there was a foot and mouth scare. Um, uh, there could be, you know, of a foot and mouth in Argentina there not that long ago. You know, that's had a bit of a ripple and there's just so many different contributing factors. There's no way, there's no recipe to go, oh, this is what's going to happen now. It's like, I don't know. I don't know. Who knows what's going to happen? No. You know, good season, prices are shit. Yeah, you so know? what's happened? What what has happened in the last few months? I, don't, I mean, has something changed? I just can't quite see what... Well, I think it's hit a bit of a it, it's hit a bit of a peak in terms of numbers. I think there's uh, been um, a lot of breeders have been kept. People paid a lot of money for breeders, so they got to a point they're producing a lot of offspring. They're hitting the market. Um, there's just the smallest hint of dry. You know, I know Burra started. We sort of stopped running in December, okay, okay. and so I think there was not panic, but there was like, oh shit, everyone's had three years. I mean, I'm talking for ourselves, Burra, but there's been pretty much widespread you know, good seasons for three years up and down the East Coast, uh, Eastern, Eastern Australia. So I think there's um, it was a bit of a like, oh, shit, you know, a couple of months of dry, what's it going to do? We kind of maybe a bit of complacency. Um, that's probably on-farm kind of decision-making and, 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 and behaviour. <clears throat> and then I guess very volatile overseas markets. There's probably, you know, I mean, inflation, the dollar, you know, yeah. export. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, all those things contribute to it. And then there's also just the players in the market, like feedlots kind of not quoting for a few weeks and everyone starts spewing, going, oh, I should have better offload them because they mightn't be taking any cattle for next, you know, for another month and then there's a panic sort of sell down or there's – I mean, I think there's more, much more to it than just the, mar- the, the dollar per kilo is as a response to um, uh, a market, a very simple market of supply and demand. <clears throat> There's so many more things going on there, you know. Oh yeah, no, it's it's, it's such a unpredictable world for farmers that sort of, and you sort of, which makes you understand why farmers uh, are are quite he- hesitant, reluctant to change their practices because there's so much that they can't control, but they don't want to add another variable into the mix. I mean, it's, it takes a brave farmer to change their um, practices. Even if they know that it's not quite right, I tell you, you know, if you don't know what, what the price is going to be next year, at least if you know, well, if I do this, I'll probably get this. If you throw another variable in by saying, I'm going to change, when well, you've got no idea where you could be next year. And then there's also the trap, and we've, we got caught up in it a bit, <clears throat> the trap of, like, following trends. And we got into the Wagyu thing a few years ago, but, of course, by the time you get in there, <laughs> it's gone. Like, by the time you actually got progeny on the ground. <clears throat> Why um, didn't you get into something decent like emus? <laughs> bit of emu oil, good for the complexion. <laughs> emus, alpacas. What else has there been? Oh, God those ostriches what. for a Ostriches, while. that's right. A hobo. Wasn't it? Yeah, that, yeah, that was. Yeah, so there's the horticultural ones as well. I mean, there's all sorts. Uh, I, I mean... I was talking to someone the other day about um, not a dissimilar kind of conversation and it reminded me of, I think it was JFK that said, you know, farmers are the only people that that, that um, buy, buy retail, sell wholesale and pay transport both ways. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, and that's, that's, that's pretty standard. And then you throw on top of that 
all the other variables of like, you know, if I can, you know, make this cow and have a calf and sell it, like that's 18 months down the yeah, track. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, like well, who, who can ever. And in Australia, the, the, the ver- ver- climate variable is just such an overwhelming one, at least in Europe or in the US even. It's reasonably predictable that you'll get, when you'll get rain and how much. You can make decisions based on <clears throat> some okay. confidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But speaking of the US, yeah, did yeah. you see that? Well, I, just thinking back of our previous conversation, did you see that that, that there was a on dairies? There was a dairy fire in Texas. Uh, how many? Uh, eighteen thousand. Eighteen. Eighteen thousand cattle yeah. in a, in one in a dairy. I just and like no one thought to open a gate or but turn uh, the hose how on. How big are those dairies? I know, enormous. Eighteen thousand is a lot. I thought you know, like some thousands. I know there's some big dairies, <clears throat> you know, probably within an hour, hour and a half of Borua, north of us, and they are in the thousands, but 18,000 is unheard of. It must <clears throat> it would have to cover like four or five acres. That must be a, yeah, that must fall under the category of a factory, though, yeah. surely. Like, yeah, you yeah. know, 18,000 cattle to perish. Yeah, you can't get them out. You can't get them out, yeah, you yeah. know, into a paddock or, or onto a road or some area that's somewhat safe. That is enormous. That has to be a factory kind of a thing. Yeah. But, I mean, even the ones that I know of that are some thousands, there's not much of their diet, and maybe it depends on the time of year, but I think as a general kind of management, <clears throat> and this is just how it works for them because it's effective and efficient and so on, not much of their feed is from having roamed around and eaten it straight off the thing. A lot of it's given, you know, <clears throat> it's, 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 it's cut, it's silage, it's hay, it's, it's, it's a meal, it's a, it's a ration. That's delivered. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. and they're shedded. Yeah, yeah. And I, and, you know, I guess there's a degree of efficiencies in that. In that you're, you're not. They're not wasting food out in the paddock. They're not creating. You know. You know. They're not um, creating compaction on the soil. As a, particularly in wet country, if you can't, you know, if you're daring in wet country and you've got um, a, a high rainfall for a couple of weeks, then it might be a month or so before you can get cattle back onto those paddocks. It, where you've got a high productivity, um, high pressure, that sort of loss can have a big impact. So I sort of sort of understand it, but um, yeah, I don't. But that is just incredible that you have that intensity. And it may not be the biggest one over there either. Just the one that we <laughs> we now know about. Yeah, <clears throat> that will, but, but no longer exists. But that you've got to wonder about. Oh, I yeah, mean, look, no, you know, just... we, we, it's another podcast about conspiracy theories and why that would happen and. All the pressures on on cattle and farting and methane and all the horrible things that cows are doing to the planet. <sighs> yeah, no, well, I mean, it just it it doesn't help. Uh, yeah, I mean, if people hear that, then that's just people. Of course, they think this is what what's wrong. This, this industrial farming is is wrong. Well, that's the that's I guess the fact we're even talking about it. It is interesting that 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 many more people know about an eighteen thousand. Mm. Head dairy and go. Well, hang on, how? Did, let's forget that it got caught on fire, which is really sad. But like, well, how the hell is that even <laughs> even a thing? You know, yeah, and what yeah, and what? Yeah. What's the quality of the stuff coming out of that? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> You'd have to wonder. Yeah. Um. So where were we? We're in Tassie. We've moved away. Do we take sheep with us? Do we take these? Ah. Uh, so we took. Yeah, that's right. So we'll work. We're, so and I guess that we were there for most of my. Uh, Primary school, and then we moved to a smaller property nearby on red soils again, um, and then that sort of took me through high school again with a few sheep. So my dad at that stage was getting a bit older, so he was looking to reduce his workload. And mum was was had was pretty sick at that stage, so we'd moved to a smaller place um, closer to t- town, but still on the red soils and still with sheep. I mean, we still had enough sheep that we would um, kill a sheep, kill a lamb, or well, my dad had this great idea that we, we killed the older ones, <laughs> which was which was sort of made sense. Then you can grow the younger ones on a bit, but you ca- ca- killed the older ones, and the, they were bloody tough. Though. You had to cook them for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> mutton, good <laughs> yeah, mutton, mutton. <clears throat> mutton. <clears throat> classic. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but we always had sheep, so we always, and we had gardens, uh, so we mostly had our own food, uh, like, yeah, meat and yeah. three veg, yeah, most nights with that. 
Is that been a thing that's been a theme for you? Is that something that was was normal then and is normal now kind of thing? I think, no, <clears throat> well, I mean, when I was growing up, meeting three veg was, yeah, I mean, if you got that, you were doing pretty well. Um, I mean, it's huge, changed hugely. I think um, I remember when I was growing up, coffee was hugely exotic. Like a, 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 bot, a jar of Nescafe, whoa. Blend that family's through. Doing, yeah. That or, family's or, doing all right. Or Pablo, Pablo remember yeah, Pablo? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, coffee was quite new and certainly, you know, spaghetti, that was exotic. Open the can of high spaghetti. <laughs> oh, not, not even the, like, the stuff you, you no. cook, you cook, no, like, no, a, no. It, yeah. It's a can, yeah. <laughs> and on toast? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's on a bit right. of buttercup, oh, what's it called, buttercup or whatever they were. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, no, so, oh, yeah, no, that was pretty standard there. I don't think there was a a lot of adventure, and particularly, well, Northwest Tassie is a pretty conservative place. Mm. Not, not a lot of uh, non-white Anglo's in that part of the world that were bringing in new ideas about food. Or, I mean, I, I so we we're sort of grown up there in the seventies, but really it was the fifties. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. A bit little behind the. Rest of the yeah, yeah. which was sort of, was just sort of in, in many ways it was sort of nice. That like it was, you know, it, it, it was it was a bit of a cosseted existence. It was sort of oh, you know, you weren't being challenged by some of these new ideas about uh, female equality and things like that. Was not being challenged. Um, mm. uh, yeah, no, it was it was very uh, insular, insular uh, that part of the world. But as I say, I mean, there's still it. There is a. a, a feeling of being cosseted in such a world, unless you're someone that wasn't. Like if, if, if you were uh, gay or, or even if you're female, you know, you had pretty limited uh, life ahead of you. Um, if, yeah, if, yeah, if you're living there or that was, that, that's where you grew up and that was the normal. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, little dog. What's doggy's name? Stella. Stella. <laughs> Stella. Dad, I'll be finished. Well, I won't be finished with Dad in the next couple of minutes, but... <laughs> Um, so, and then Tassie, did you move off Tassie? You must have moved uh, at some point. Uh, so I went to uni down there and then... Um, Lonnie? No, Hobart. Hobart. The big city. Yeah, right. So I went down there uh, about yeah, 17 and then did a degree. Um, then, yeah, I was lucky enough to get a job. Degree in? Uh, degree in science. Science, yeah. yeah. And, and you, you mentioned, you know, basalt, you were here and there was basalt soil and there's basalt soil. Was there? Did you major in soil in in the science? I uh, did some soils, but no, it's not, soil's not something you really major in. Um, most of my soil, soil learning was after I finished my degree, and then doing some postgraduate study. Um, so yeah, when I left uh, university, I got a job with DPI, and you know you learn the, the mentors that you have when you first get into work really determines how well you learn, what you learn and how well you learn it. So I've had a, had a couple of great mentors there, a, a uh, botanist and a um, geomorphologist, uh, and, and we s- mapped um, soils throughout Tassie, south, southeast Tassie, central Tassie, southwest Tassie. So I, when I was going through um, university, I did a lot of bushwalking um, and then got out of university and got paid to go bushwalking all through the southwest, um, you know, carrying tents, looking at describing soils, describing vegetation, mapping land systems, this association between vegetation, uh, geomorphology and soils. You know, we we're talking about where soils come from. So you've got soils that form from geology, a, a driving force, topography. Whether, whether you're in a flat or a slope or whatever, um, the vegetation. So vegetation works both ways. Vegetation creates soil, but soil creates vegetation. So you've got this um, feedback mechanism. So a, so a vegetation on soils keep. So we talked about leaching of soil. So if you've got vegetation, it stops the leaching. So you've got Tree roots deep down in the soil are capture nutrients as they've been water carries it down through gravity, of course, 
and then the, the plants capture those nutrients, take it up the top and dump it on top of the soil again. So it's like it's, it, plants keep soils young because soil, as soils age, they lose nutrients and they acidify, and that's just a natural process of soil ageing. So vegetation prevents that. Um, and, that, and then, of course, it's, it's not that simple because vegetation will play little tricks. You know, they'll create soils that are toxic to other plants in order to give themselves a bit of an advantage. And so there's lots of little um, issues that go on. And, that, and then, of course, so, plants encourage biota, soil biota. You know, uh, and that determines what sort of soil um, is going to be uh, present. Yeah, so, but that, you know, that, that whole, just while we're on that, that whole issue of soils feeding, soil, uh, plants fe- feeding soil biology. Um, and I think that, you know, I mean, you've talked with plenty of uh, people before about that process of the plants feeding carbohydrates into the, into uh, the soil to encourage bacteria or fungi to give them, you know, it's a trading system. You've got this trading system below ground. Now, I think it's probably particularly important in Australia where soils are generally pretty poor. Um, so you know, nutrients are hard to come by in Australia uh, and in Australian soils. They're, you know, they're, they're hard to find. They're highly sought after. So that there's plenty of Carbohydrates, plenty. Of, so plants got have got plenty of carbohydrates, plenty of sugars. All you need to create sugars are sunlight and water, and so plants can make tons of that stuff. But what they can't get is are the nutrients: nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, etc. So there, the so plants are saying, "Look, I'll give you this cheap stuff, this carbohydrates. I've got a ton of it, and you saying this to the bacteria or the fungi, I'll give you this." And the fungi and the bacteria, they need that. So they'll go out and do a trade. Okay, we'll get to some phosphorus and give it to you and you give us the carbohydrate. So this trade is going on below ground. And it, it's, if you've, I don't know if you've read the, the Tim Lowe book on um, where the song began. So he talks about this trading going on, but this is above ground trading. So he talks about the honey eaters in, being, in Australia being such a, a dominant uh, set of birds because that the, uh, the trees are they're filled with nectar. They're pumping out nectar. So they're, say, they're giving the, all this nectar out to birds who then pollinate, you know, they're providing a service, they're providing a pollination service. So we've got, we've got a much higher proportion of uh, nectar, nectar, if, nectarivers, nectarivers, Angiosperms, is that it? That no. Fl- the, the, the flowering bird. trees? Yeah, and, but we've got the most of uh, we've got a high proportion of those that are pollinated by vertebrates, by, bird, oh, by but birds. The, 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 the birds who are birds, seeking the nectar. Kind yeah, of and the glide. Nectar-seeking birds yeah, and, and yeah. Other, other animals. Yeah, but... but, but so is that, is, that a, is that like a... Is that the case in Australia because it's, it's, that's got a, we need, we need that, that um, function to... Um, well, why is well, it why is it particularly high in Australia? Is there a reason? Because for that? I think it because, because it's it they because plants are not going to create they don't want to create seeds they don't want to spend a lot of uh, time creating seeds with lots of nutrients in them that then have to be transported. They would prefer to get their genetics mixed by pollination by the pollination. So they get pollinators that are car- carrying these genetic mixes across or helping them to provide the new generation with these cross breeds. So I think the ne- getting the, the uh, birds to provide this pollination helps with that. But is there some relationship between... The- yeah, and then the nutrients. Yeah. Because the birds that are then eating the, the nectar, of course they're not, there's no nutrients in nectar, it's just sugar. So the, the birds... And I, will actually go out and seek insects. So even the honey eaters eat insects. But the, the ins- but they'll seek out insects and spend more energy collecting an insect than the insect provides. So they're providing, they spend more energy collecting that insect. So it's like running down to the shop and buying a lettuce, <laughs> running back and thinking that you're making a, a, a positive contribution to your <laughs> nu- nutrient intake. 
but <clears throat> but in their case, the they're not after the insect for energy. They're after the insect for the nitrogen and the phosphorus. The protein. And so they'll yeah. actually expend excess energy to catch those because they need their diet is McDonald's. They've just got it's just sugar, yeah. so they need to add to it. To balance, it's kind of to balance it. Yeah, and and you know the plants have just got excess amounts of. Carbohydrates, and and you you know you see it in, in plants basically shed carbohydrates. They just you know the the manna, uh, manna gums are just shedding uh, sugars, and the and the psyllids, the lerps. I mean they've got so much sugar there that they're just expelling it. They just expel it, and they're tr- because they're trying to get nutrients. And not that there's a ton of sugar, but they want nutrients. It's a very nutrient limited environment that we live in in Australia. And so that's why we have these special species that have evolved to deal with these low nutrient environments and this association between, so we've got the proteaceous, proteaceous uh, species, the banksias and the gavillias and that, that have developed special mechanisms to access phosphorus. Phosphorus, of course, is one of our main limiting nutrients. Any farmer knows that superphosphate is, you know, is, We've applied it in large quantities, and it's had huge impact upon the productivity of um, the farmland that are around us. But you know, the phosphorus in many cases is there. It's just how do you access it? It's locked. So when you say when it's there, because there's, you know, um, uh, it can be argued that I think a lot of phosphorus gets applied, and you know, Buru a prime example. Um, Gener- you know, decades and decades of phosphorus application, super year after year after year, and you know, and then you know, measurement soil measurements are done, and there's a whole lot of phosphorus there, it's just all locked up. Yeah. So I guess there's naturally occurring phosphorus. Yeah. Well, or maybe not much of it. That's why there was that big response. But then things happen within the soil with the application of super phosphate. Whilst it's a phosphorus source, does it initiate chemical reactions that actually Ultimately, keep it locked up. Is yeah. what? Yeah, is that how that? Yeah. So the phosphorus that you apply get bound quite quickly. So the plants, so it's applied in a soluble form mostly, and so therefore it's immediately available. But it doesn't move very far in the soil before before it gets bound by soil particles, by the mineral particles, and and then over time it gets to be more strongly bound. So are these red soils? They're full. Of, they have very high phosphorus levels, but at any point in time you know, less than 1% of it is available to plants. And, um, you know, it's a bit like having, you know, if you've got a water tank on your property, um, but you've got your, your tap to access that water is broken and only just drips out. Okay, and it shows you all, if you want a drink of water, then you have to put your glass under the tap and sit there for <laughs> a hour. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So how... So you know the water's there, but you just can't access it. There's a yeah. ton of water, but you just can't access it. That's what these soils are like. So you have to be able to turn that tap on. Um, and so, you, you know, and mycorrhizal fungi have provided that opportunity. So plants use mycorrhizal fungi to access that bound, to turn on the tap, give them access to that phosphorus that is unavailable to them otherwise because mycorrhizal fungi have that, uh, a whole lot of mechanisms for accessing um, that bound phosphorus. So how do we, as a say a farmer, <clears throat> I'm, I guess I'm maybe, uh, am I going to be a grazier or a cropper? Maybe yeah. a grazy, grazing, because that's more relevant to me and probably a lot of listeners, but we maybe jump into the cropping side of it too. Or maybe it's the same thing. How do we, <clears throat> how does one, with that in mind, so to me I'm thinking, okay, if the, if the fungi and the mycorrhizae are there, they're the sort of the, they're the suppliers or they're the, the miners of the phosphorus or the unlockers of the phosphorus, what can we do for them, with them, to them, to sort of enhance that, 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 their function, their pro- that process? Well, I, I guess that, that's one of the simplest things is to encourage that above-ground growth, which in, increases the rate of carbohydrate production, and then the plants have got something to trade with. So you can't have a healthy below-ground fungal system without it being driven by lots of production above ground. So the production above ground, then the plants have got something to trade with. So then you can, 
But yeah, I mean, the mycorrhizae have to be there, but oh, there's a lot of complexity within the tens of thousands of species of mycorrhizae. Which ones take, um, which ones will plants associate with, under which circumstances? There's a lot of research still to be done there. But we can nurture the low ground biota, and the, including the mycorrhizae, by adding organic matter, by encouraging productivity of the site. Not you know, it's, if, of course, if you graze, if you're talking about grazing and you graze a paddock right down, then suddenly there's nothing being put below ground. You haven't got productivity above ground, so you haven't got sugars being released below ground. And, of course, then the mycorrhizae that you've started to build the population, and suddenly their food supply goes, then they go into torpor. They, ha- they have to shut down. Um, so you, you, it's a, a matter of maintaining that high productivity below ground by maintaining high productivity above ground, having that, you know, that's the engine. The engine of the of the paddock is above ground. That's where your petrol is being produced and then you're pumping it below ground and getting that below ground engine up and going. And their, their role is to go out and grab all those nutrients and drag them in and trade them. So I guess there's lots of opportunities for a land manager to to influence in a positive way and definitely negative way too, I guess. When we, when Hamish Mackay and I do our biodynamic workshops, we often, you know, there's the question of, you know, adding things, you know, can you add something to make something happen? Well, yes, you can. Um, can is there something we can do without adding it but stimulates it? Well, yes, you can. And, and Hamish, we always sort of say, well, I guess there's two ways you can do things and the analogy is a fly, flies in a room, you can, you can, if you want to get flies in a room, in this case it might be fungus, you might want to improve, increase the fungus, you can, you can get flies in a jar and put it in the room, open it, and then they work out where they want to stay. And they may not want to stay in the room yeah, yeah, and you yeah. may not get what you want. Or you put a bit of meat in there and the flies will come because you create oh, the yeah, environment yeah, yeah, for yeah, them yeah. to come in. Is that, that's a similar kind of analogy with, with soil and how would that, <clears throat> what would that look like? What, is there things that we can put as farmers into the soil, like meat into the room for the flies that can... Can can get the the fungi. I mean, apart from the plants pumping carb uh, um, uh, sugars, yeah, 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 yeah. is there something that you know one can do that that you you would endorse or advocate that that kind of is that way of doing it? I know there's lots of ways to kind of crank a system, but yeah, I mean, I guess that the the, the whole the, the below ground um, ecosystem is still. And I'm not an expert on the below ground eco, you know, on the ecosystem, on the microbiology. That's a whole nother realm, um, and that's you know that we're still learning a lot about that. It's just such a, a lot of complexity, and about how you encourage species and how you encourage the right species. I'm I'm not sure how. I mean, I guess like I say, um, organic matter is one way to do it. Um, but but also not just you know it's not as simple as just carbohydrates. The other thing that you want is complexity of of your organic matter. So just having you now, of course, it, like the rainforest around here, if you've got a whole mix of species, um, that's creating a whole range of different organic matter branches, leaves um, at different you know different uh, quantities of lignification, so stuff that is really hard to break down and then you've got nice tasty leaves, or soft leaves that might be quite quick to break down and that encourages a diversity. I think so trying to encourage diversity below ground is also really important. So mixed species above ground creates um, a, 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 a architecture below ground. So not only do you want to create different um, sources of carbohydrates and and um, organic matter, but you're also creating different levels of organic matter. So just as you, so if you go into a forest, you've got trees that are short and spread out, and you've got trees that go straight up and then spread out, or trees that really just uh, don't go anywhere, just cover the ground. You want, and if you look at that architecture above ground, you you can. Imagine that same architecture being reflected below ground. You've got some roots that will go straight out, some that will penetrate out right down, and you really need to have some understanding of that architecture to try to take make use of it. Species that are lazy rooters, you know, it's, 
some some um uh, so I did my uh PhD on um forest trees and some trees are are lazy rooters so that they won't go go d- down deep because they've evolved in conditions where you know the main thing that they have to compete for is light so they just get their roots out just enough to give them enough nutrients and enough water to go to put their head up as quick as they can you know, so some of the species like um oh well you know some of the species that, that have evolved on the alluvial plains plenty of water plenty of nutrients and really the competition is about uh light so you know black butt for instance is a bit of a lazy rooter um whereas other species you know that they have evolved in really tough conditions like spotted gum for instance you know the old spotted gum well this is this is tough conditions for the north coast <laughs> once you get out west you You've got another whole level of tough conditions. Toughness, yeah. yeah, but that's but they won't grow. They won't. They'll they'll put up a few leaves, and then all the energy that they uh, create from the from photosynthesis that goes below ground. So they'll be sitting there, and and you think they're not doing anything, but what they're doing is putting down roots, putting down roots, and pushing hard down into the soil. So because they know. They've 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 evolved in tougher conditions. They know oh, it might be good now, but I know that you know in two or three years' time, if I haven't got roots deep down, I'm gone. But, and that's where the pressure is for them. It's survival in those tough conditions. So that's the number one priority for them. And I think that that's you know that understanding of what's going on below ground is really complex. We don't have much data on on the different rooting mechanisms of us, particularly our native species, but even many of our commercial species. So I think that, so if I'm looking at a forest, you try to create diversity and you assume that that diversity above ground will be reflected below ground. I think in pasture management, um, doing the same sort of thing, diversity above ground will be reflected by diversity below ground in roots and, and uh, organic matter production, but also that will encourage diversity of of uh, the soil biota, and there's and, and again, that also <clears throat> creates a diverse diet, doesn't it? Too for the animals eating it. So uh, yeah, you know, so there's absolutely. the diet that the, the the you know the diversity of plants and the sugars. I guess the sugars could be slightly different and different nutrient contents and different times and all sorts of variations there, which is which is which is great. But also the, the nutrients available to grazing animals. Is going to be varied as well, isn't it? You know, different yeah. times of year, different levels, different you know, even availabilities and that sort of thing. Yeah, so and, they, a- and, the, and, the, and they need different um, nutritional levels. I mean, a, a, a cow that's got a calf is going to need different nutrients than um, you know, a young um, a beast growing quickly. So, mm. I, mean, I mean, and that's the sorts of things I guess that grazers graziers have to manage all the time. I can make a joke about lazy rooters, but I but I won't. <laughs> um, um, Walter Yano at the at the RCS conference um, in 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 the um, in July last year in Brisbane, he um, and he'd said it somewhere else, and I was going, "Oh God, is he going to say it?" And he did. He talked about rootability, um, and he knew he was everyone was pissing themselves, <laughs> yeah, because such a lovely. You know, gentleman was talking. It was a classic. He knew it. Um, you kept a straight face the whole way through that, though, John. Um, uh, I was waiting for you to. Come. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I wanted you to get that out. I wanted you. I needed you to finish that. that. I, know, I, was, I was wondering how many times I'd have to say "lazy rooter" before you. <laughs> I think I approached it pretty well, didn't you I? Did, you yeah, know I made the joke without making the joke. Um, so let's get back to – oh, no, my question is, so um, soil, degree, so, uh, sorry, science, um, at what point did you, does one, sort of go, oh, I'm going to start a career in soil? It's interesting. I like it. it I don't know. What, what, was the, what was the catalyst for you to kind of go, right, I'm going to put the energy into, into that? Yeah, that's, I think that's a really good question. I think that – and that, and it's sort of um, – I mean, I, I'd say that soils to me are like – for me, it, it's a passion, and everyone, you know, everyone has to have a passion. But for me, when I first started out, soils were an interest, you know, and they were part of a bigger scheme. And I enjoyed the challenge of describing soils and vegetation and and mapping. And it was it was a challenge, but it wasn't something that I was passionate about. But as you learn more, and 
more and more about it, then you understand the complexity and the importance. Then you, your passion develops. You know, people sort of it's sort of interesting to me that people come to university and they say, "Oh, yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't really got got a passion." I, you don't you, you don't wake up one morning and have a passion. Not many people do. I mean, maybe some artists do, but um, you know, I don't think. I think a passion that develops has a lot more depth to it than one that you're suddenly struck with. If if you sort of wake up with a passion one morning, you know, what's going to stop you a month later wake up with a different passion? So I, I mean, I um, for, for me it did, but initially. Um, initially for me it was an intellectual exercise it was a challenge and I enjoyed and it was part of what I enjoyed doing but over time you actually you know, maybe it's just getting older too but over time it becomes a lot more spiritual a lot more um, you know you become more strongly attached to the science to soil science and not so much uh, as an inter- well, as an intellectual exercise, but more than that, more a feeling of your association with the soil, that link to the soil that we as a race has developed over the last two million years. Not su- you know, not surprisingly, it's been it's been what has kept us alive uh, for two million years. So therefore, it's understandable that we have developed these links to soil. Um, and so I guess that yeah, that's developed for me over time. Um, and I mean, yeah, I mean, and there's probably a lot more uh, science to it than that. I mean, you you see guys like Peter Cundall or or Costa. I mean, they're, they're passionate about uh, gardening, but have they always been? I, I I think they've just been out in the garden. And they've you know, I've got some of those endorphins that are secreted by some of the bacteria, and that and that we know um, are there. You know that that geosmin, that that petrichor that you smell when you get uh, rain after a dry period. Every, we know that spell. What's it's, it called? Petrichor. Petrichor, yeah, or geosmin. Um, it comes from a uh, actinomycete bacteria, um, and as and we can smell that at at something like. Five parts in a trillion, and so it's it's in it, it's in us. It, it, this we, we almost have receptors for it. Is that we have that? receptors. Yeah. We definitely <clears throat> have receptors for it. And maybe it, it makes sense. You know, it, it makes sense, and it, it it leads to the release of serotonin, the happy drug for us. And um, so you smell that rain coming, or the raindrops that have arrived, and it uh, you, you feel you know it it, it buoys you. And it's probably, may, I mean, this is purely my theory, that, you know, we evolved on the plains of Africa where you've got dry, wet periods. During the dry, things get tough, and then the first range, you know, that the good times are coming. Now the game is coming back, the vegetation is going to grow. So, you know, that first smell of rain is telling you, okay, this is the best part of the year. And I think that... You know, there's still those sorts of links to soil to our past that are inherent with our, within our genetics. So, and and you know, most gardeners are like that. They need to get out in the soil and smell it and be part of it. And I think that that's something that is missing in for a lot of people in our society. They don't have that link to nature. Um, that that is so important. It's so important psychologically. For people to have that link, um, you know, there was a, a a great story um, of a um, a hospital for mental illness. I think it was in one of the Baltic com- countries. They bought a, a piece of land that adjoined the hospital and and uh, planted it and allowed people to walk through it. And they reju- reduced the the amount of drug usage by fifty percent. People just being in nature, and the relaxing relaxation that occurred, the benefits that applied um, was more than made up. The price, the cost of the uh, buying that land was more than made up for by the reduction in drugs that they saved. Well, the pharmaceutical companies wouldn't have been happy about it. <laughs> <clears throat> but it's interesting you say that because there's, uh, you know, there's probably another. There's element. There's elements of um, being in that environment and and the smells and the 
the the biome and the breathing that biome and what that does for you know epigenetics and kind of gene expression and that's over a period of time. There's also well they've got to get out of the building to that plot, so there's movement. Yes, you know yeah, there's expectation. Yeah. There's like well, gee, that was fun last time. There's even the you know I guess the just getting sunshine. Okay, they got to cop a bit of sunshine on the way there, and they're also going to be grounding. You know, if they bother to take their shoes off, they're going to get that bit of a bit of a charge. You know, whatever it is, up and down, whatever that charge is of being being barefooted on the earth. There's so many. You're, 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 elements. you're being way too scientific about this. No, you're you're, 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 you're taking it down to the variables. <laughs> I, was just, I was just trying to look at it from a very broad spiritual level. No, <laughs> I, no, I love it. No, but I reckon that. But there's, but there's a. I guess you're right. There's, a, there's a. There's a there's a, there's a lot of science around that, but I but I love the fact that it is a combination of all those things. That you know, science is so good at like, you know, pulling it apart and going, that's what's happening, and that's really important. And the, you know, the, the the amazing thing, the amazing things that science can unearth in 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 the study of and the research and everything, and experimentation, and then there's the <clears throat> the holistic approach of, you know, someone feels better. Because of all those, all those things add up at different amounts. You know, a bit more sun this day, yeah, but less yeah. that day or whatever. And then the, but then the, <clears throat> there is a bit, there is a real spiritual thing. It, it is about we we have in in our genes receptors for all those things that we don't even you know can fully understand, like receptors for the smell of a of a tree that we may never have actually. It may have been generations of our family have never even been anywhere near that tree. Mm. Maybe centuries, but we have a receptor for that particular. Yep. You know, apparently yep. we've all got receptors for marijuana, <laughs> and you know, I know mum and that mum and dad haven't. Well, I don't know. I should ask them, <laughs> but I don't think so. You know, so. But I, I'm 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 always fascinated by how, you know, humans how they how they are in nature, and and I totally agree about the it's what's missing, or one of the biggest things that's missing, and and it's it's the it's the medicine, or it's the it's the aspect of wellness that um, so many people are don't experience, and it isn't normal for them, you know. And it's really, I mean, you live in a very natural state, you know, and you have all sorts of interesting biome that you're breathing in. And I love, you know, Zach Bush. He talks about the eagle that soars in the sky and his breath. You know, you 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 pick up a a bazillionth, trillionth of of that in mm. your in your in your lungs, and in that that. You know that becomes part of you. That you know, and I just think it's it's just eternally fascinating how we interact with nature in so many different ways that benefit us, and we don't even know it. Yeah, no, and, and, and we I'm, I'm part of a land care group here, and we did a which one? A Tell wine, us. wine land care. Oh yeah, I mean it's very active. We've done some great stuff, but one of the best things that we ever did was a um, biophilia exhibition. So the biophilia, love of nature, basically, um, and I, I think it was you know I, I think the term was coined around the nineteen twenties, and it sort of comes and goes. But the, and we just termed it biophilia, and and it's sort of to try to expand to people that just don't want to come out and like plant trees. And we were overwhelmed with people that wanted to put in an artwork with the central theme of bio, biophilia. And what they saw as nature, and I mean, it just brought, brought people complete. It, it drew people together because it, we have this common love of nature. People that wouldn't have come out too hard to come out and plant a tree, but you know, I do love nature. I mean, how, why have we got so many landscape painters? Because they love painting landscape. They love being out in nature. Why? Why do people go to play golf? Can't be chasing that little white ball around, can it? It's got to be a really good other reason, <laughs> isn't there? Yeah, what right. do they say? Golf's a good way to ruin a <laughs> ruin a walk. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just like you said. You know, you were getting paid to go bushwalking. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, and that, I mean, that was sort of interesting as well. I mean, I when I went to university, you know, a few mates of mine they'll say, "Oh, why don't you do medicine?" Um, we, I'm, I'm going to do medicine. I said, oh, I don't, I'm not really interested in cutting people up. They said, Oh, look, but well, you, you know, you've got the marks. Why don't you, you know, it, it's a good thing to do. And anyway, you know, after I finished, and I was going out bushwalking, these, and these were mates that would bushwalk with me when we were going through university. And then when I got out, and I was said, Oh, yeah, I've got this job where I go go out bushwalking, and they were going into hospitals to do their internship. Mm-hmm. And they said, How come you get to do that? I said, well, that's what I chose to do. 
you know, this you have to make these choices about where where you want to be and what you want to do. And I, I guess you know, I was just bloody lucky. I just, I think I've been bloody lucky all my life. Now, was it bloody luck that got you up to the Northern Rivers? Because we 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 haven't even got there yet, and we're an hour and twenty in. So you, uh, yeah, well, I think that. So I'd been down there, and I met my fabulous partner down there. In Tassie. Uh, in Tassie, yeah. yeah. So she'd come down to do some time in Hobart. Um, not 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 some time, <laughs> not in a prison, <laughs> not in a prison sense. <laughs> Wasn't a convict. <laughs> no, no. Um, so she'd come down there. I was working, uh, and so I'd been working in, in the bush for a while at that stage. Did you uh, look like you'd been in the bush for a while? Yep. <laughs> Pretty rugged? <laughs> yeah, long hair and, yeah. Bearded and rough, um, but <laughs> I, but I was also thinking, oh, you know, I think after I'd spent um, uh, a winter there, you know, another winter I'd spent there after a summer that consisted of three days, I'd sort of got we'd gone back into the next winter, you know, in Tassie, if you're lucky to get a summer, and then it might only be three days long. So we'd gone back into another winter, and I was out working in the bush and doing soil augering and doing texturing and that. And the ground, the ground was frozen, and you know, he's sort of digging snow off the surface in order to get down to the ground. And I was thinking, oh, there must be better places to do this. I'm getting too old for this. And so, she, were, her parents were up at Cooma, oh, yeah. uh, so they had a sheep, pretty well, fresh part of the world there too. Yeah, there? yeah. Well, but they were actually a bit further, closer to the the snowies than that. They were up around Berrydale. Oh yeah. Um, or, or down near Dalgetty, they had cheap, cheap property down there, and um, so we came up there, up uh, she, there to meet the parents and do all that, and then we did a bit of a road trip. What they, what they think of you? Uh, I think they were a bit shocked. <laughs> did you Did you have to have a tidy up? Uh, I think I remember we stopped by uh, Lake George on the way. Um, down to see them, and I think she pulled out a pair of scissors and just tried to do a <laughs> bit of a clean up. But no, I still had the long hair, and I think that. But yeah, no. To their credit, they they uh, were they were very welcoming. I think mm. that, you know they, were, they were, have been very kind to me. So no, we tied it up, and then we did a bit of a trip that came up here. I find that supremely fascinating about the. Um and something I've banged on before, and um, uh, uh, Zach Bush, um, you know, that's that's been one of my biggest inspirations about, I guess, the 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 holistic approach or the appreciation, acknowledgement of of environment and how how the impact it has on us. And and every time I hear Zach Bush, he seems to have another, or not not another angle, as in a different angle. He has an additional angle on all of that, and I don't know where he's getting his research or what experiences he's having, but I just love the way that he's able to um, pull all that together. Now, while I'm, I'm just going to take that out of there and swap this little puppy over. Um, John, you're are you familiar with the work of Zach Bush? Did I mention him before? Yeah, I think I, I have. Uh, some of my students are uh, aficionados or. Very much. Very, they're, they're keen on his work. And I've, yeah, I've seen your, um, your interview with Zach. I haven't read any of his stuff. Here we are. We're back on. Um, he is. Um, uh, I was just saying while you're out of the room there, it's fascinating that. Um, Every time I hear him, he has, and I'm referencing him because we were talking about biome and kind of being in nature. And he's, he's you know, one of his themes or one of his greatest. He's an advocate of, um, of getting people in nature and breathing that biome, as I did the, you know, the eagle and the whatever else and the epigenetic side of it all. But he always seems to have another angle, not not a different one, but an additional kind of another layer of. It's intrigue of intrigue for the listeners or the viewers, going, where the hell did that come from? Like the way he's able to thread all that together and 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 keep building the story is um is incredible. So you were heading to um, uh, you were you had the, you'd had the tidy up. Oh, no, you were heading up this way. Yeah, so we, headed up, we did a bit of a trip. Uh, so that was and came up here and went through uh, Bellingen, Dorigo, then came up 
loop back, then went down New England, and so they just did a bit of a, a tour of this part of the world, and sort of, and then went back to Tassie for yeah another few years. And but I think they always we always thought, well, at some stage we'll come up, escape Tassie, and come up, and, and then the opportunity arose. I think I was finishing one particular contract down there, and then uh, someone offered me some work. Up here, so we took that opportunity to head up um, and started up here. In here? No, we, no. I think we first we first went to Almara on down near Grafton. Oh yeah, yeah. right on the on the mighty Clarence there. Mm. Fantastic. I mean, mate, you know, it's it, it's just uh, you know, I felt so fortunate to have been on, be able to live in these different places because you do absorb that energy like that. You know, of being in a place, being in a place for a while, and that the, the, the Clarence, the power and the majesty of that river just flowed straight past our door. Um, we were renting down there. You know, you sort of, it, it does, it, you know, the memories, and probably part of it, it's things like the smell and mm. that, that are subconscious. You don't even there know, but, but you don't even realise that they're there. But when you think about, oh, I think about that time, then it just it's overwhelming the, the, the feeling of being there and the, and it's probably the remembrance of the smells and all that different environment there's noises different birds um, different trees every, and you know just different climate so we were there for a little while while we looked north and south um, looking south at Grafton we were looking south around Coffs or Dori, uh, Bellingen Dorigo that sort of country or looking north up here, and uh, we ended up yeah, coming up here and buying this place. And um, so, the, with the, what was the any standout features of here? Like, because I mean, a lot, a lot of this country is similar, isn't it? Sort of, you know, from northern rivers down Grafton, and you know, there's sort of there's 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 variations. I'm sure there's probably soil type variations too. There was there when when did you like walk in here and go, oh, this is the spot? Did you look at that tree and go, this is the spot? Was no, it no. just a vibe? No, I brought my auger. Oh. The first thing. <laughs> that was your yeah, yeah, no. due diligence test. Yeah, no, no. no, no. Do you want to have a look in the house? No. I'm not, <laughs> not interested in your house. I want to have a look at the soil. <laughs> so we did a bit of a walk around the property and, yeah, drilling holes as we went. Totally. And then, yeah, oh, this is, yeah, this is home. Is that right? What was it about the soil that... Oh, no, this was this was the same soil. This is the same soil from Tassie that I grew up on. Uh, it's the same red ferrous holes, the same presnism. So it was like coming home. I mean, completely, you know, above ground, different, different climate, but you know, the soil was the same. So that felt good. Yeah, yeah. This was what I wanted. I, you know, I, I guess that, um, yeah, good rainfall. That was a big, that was a big positive for me. Uh, and a little warmer than Tassie. Yeah, um, doesn't feel like it now. <laughs> no, yeah, it's cooling off, isn't it? I mean, I'm, 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 I'm I mean, I'm, I'm from Burua, so I'm, I'm, I'm. This is like quite hot. Yeah. <laughs> um, though our summers do get pretty hot. Um, John, talking about up here. Um, oh no, I'll get to the flood. I wanted to get to the floods of last year. Um, and then when did you start at Southern Cross? So I worked up here uh, again. So, uh, in yeah, soils and looking at uh, so forestry was people were starting to plant trees up here, plantation forestry. Oh, so what start, sort of? Timber? So they had a few species that they were planting. Um, uh, so spotted gum and black button. So uh, native, yeah, native mm. uh, eucalypts. Um, and then uh, so that was going reasonably. You know, that was just as part of a. Um, farm management system to have part of your property planted to trees. And usually the part that you, that you plant, plant to plantation was the part that you didn't want from grazing anyway, so the, the shitty, upper slopes. Yeah, Because yeah, right, yeah. the trees don't like the poorly drained country, mm. you know, so you put them up on the slopes, which where you've got, you know, the grass doesn't like, you know, it dries off too quick. And so they, you let, keep the grass on the flats and you run the, and then you can run the cattle through the trees once you get them up after a, a couple of years. So that sort of that sort of fitted. I thought it was a good part of land management. And then things went a bit crazy for a while, where um, 
I think there was a tax deduction for plantations and you started to get prospectus uh, plantings going and, and, and it just, people were planting trees all over the place and, and poor, in, inappropriate trees. and So more, uh, more exotic species going in? No, not, no, just species that should, that were, you know, they, they were being planted because they grew fast. But then if you talk to the sawmillers, they said, no, we don't want that. That's rubbish. Yeah. So, you know, they weren't looking forward far enough to what they were going to do with them. And, you know, one, it's a little bit like, you know, once you've got a tax uh, dodge, then people start piling money in and then you get every cowboy um, coming on board. And all the good people, the people that were genuinely interested in growing trees, were sort of caught. They were, you know, what do I, mm. if I try to do this honestly, I, I, I can't. I can't compete with these cowboys. So the whole system sort of fell apart in many ways. Lots of plantations were put in that should never have been put in, and then that um, yeah, the confidence in the whole industry was destroyed to some degree. So then I went back to, to university to do some research on what species should be planted where. But I, but yeah, the, but I guess doing the, the looking at soils in forests and looking at going right back to when I first started describing soils in national parks. I don't know why we were describing uh, southwest Tassie, like mapping soils in southwest Tassie. It's all national park, and we're doing it for the DPI. But anyway, it was great. It was a fantastic thing to do. But, you know, these are soils that were, these were untouched soils. These were, sure, I mean, First Nations people were living in southwest Tassie and they were having some management impacts upon the sites, but these soils were pretty well untouched. untouched yeah. yeah. So these, in, the, in the national parks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, you know, that gave me an opportunity to understand soils in their own right, which is quite different to understand, trying to understand soils for what they give to us. Can, yeah. So rather than, you know, yeah, of. rather than, Productivity and what species will grow. This was trying to understand soils in their own right. And soils, you know, I think you have to be careful that soils um, are an ecosystem in their own right. And in many ways, you should, in the same way that we have national parks that protect um, certain species of plants or certain species of animals, we should have parks that protect soil in their natural state because we can learn a lot from understanding how soils operate in their natural state. Because if we can reflect that in our agricultural management, we know that we can keep those soils healthy for millions of years. It's interesting, though, like, you know, people, there's, say, natural parks, snowy, snowy mountains, um, probably was managed, I imagine, you know, some hundreds of years ago and then some thousands, you know, beyond that, uh, in a way uh, managed by, you know, Indigenous People's there, um, they they they're gone. Um, cattle and horses come in. Um, that's another, well, probably not even managed, but another impact on the on the thing. And then there's lots of conjecture about whether they should be removed or not, and the damage they're doing, and whether they actually should be there grazing and sort of cycling or whatever else. I mean, I guess you know, I guess what I'm getting at is, you know, what is a natural state of a national park in Australia nowadays? Even when you were there, because it, it, a lot closer to a natural state than say a paddock, you know, up the road. But I guess you know, even those soils were probably had not been managed for some hundreds of years, as they had been previously for thousands of years. So I guess there would have been oh, some yeah. variations yeah, yeah, there yeah, somehow. Yeah, you know, that like understory, overstory would have changed. Um, no more megafauna. Yeah, you know, yeah. maybe limited. You know, um, fauna. Um, or maybe there's pigs and deer, you know. I guess. So, so, yeah, there are certainly impacts, and so, and you know, some some of the you know, surprisingly some of the worst um, land degradation I've seen I saw um, on the west coast of Tassie because you've got some very vulnerable soils there, and they were being impacted by um, fishermen that would that would start a fire and then it would rush across the button grass plains, which dominate quite a lot of southwest Tassie. Fishermen would light fires for. Uh, I think they just 
light a fire or leave a fire going. Oh, and so, so maybe more accidental than yeah. to, to do something in particular. Yeah. Yeah, so right. That, and maybe just to clear out a patch, patch close to the beach. But, uh, oh, um, yeah. but yeah, but, or that, I'd get going. Or, or campers would also, you know, walkers would let, let a fire, accidentally let a fire go. Because um, down there, the, the button grass plains are very volatile once they dry out and they'll, they'll burn quite quickly. And the soils in the button grass plains are basically organic soil. So once that dries out, you're actually burning soil. <coughs> and so that's really problematic because it, in those low nutrient sites, those, those soils have taken hundreds of thousands of years um, or millions of years to build up. So you can burn them off in one, one night. It's just um, yeah, tragic. And then nothing's holding those soils together and then they just go very quickly. A bit like, I guess, um, what the, the experience of uh, what was found or the phenomena after the, the bushfires a few years ago. You know, there was a Canberra ones, there's certainly in Victoria where, and, and down the south coast where you know, the intensity was so, it was so fierce that the soil burnt mm. and, and what's left is, is, is not much. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and you you volatilize a lot of the nutrients. You can lose a significant portion of the nutrients because it. I mean, in, particularly in salt, in um, you know fairly low nutrient sites, a lot of the nutrients, nitrogen, sulfur, etc., 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 are bound up within the vegetation, yeah. and you get that burn going through, and that, that's just lost. That's disappears. Lost. Yeah. It's interesting that um, you know some would argue that. The best thing to do after those bushfires would have been to fly over a whole lot of blackberry seed, a whole lot of, you know, farmer's friend, a whole lot of like those lower succession or yep. pioneer weed species, which would have horrified nine out of ten people. <laughs> but it's almost like that's what was almost needed. To get some carbon. To get some to get some biology, activity, vegetation, you know, so many restorative sort of functions. Yeah, yeah, you need to get vegetation on site. I mean, you know, that having bare soil is just, you know, the worst thing that you can do. So if you can get some cover on, um if you if you've got bare soil and then you've got a rain a big rainfall event, you know, you you're going you can lose a thousand years of soil in one rainfall event easily. So yeah, so it's a, it's a balancing act. How do you best balance um relatively non-problematic uh, weed species like farmer's friends. They're annoying, but, you know, you know they get, soon get shaded out. I mean, even lantana around here um, I, is not that bad <laughs> compared to um, bare ground. You're, you're better off to have lantana than bare ground. Well, I mean, I, we often get at our workshops questions about lantana and blackberry, and we say through experience, and I don't have lantana or burua, but I certainly... Um, where I went to school and where I have lived at certain times, there's lantana has been pretty prolific, and some of the best soil will be under the lantana or yeah. a blackberry because it's like a it's like a soil conditioning plant, isn't it? It's like doing it doing a job. Yeah, it's it's producing organic matter and that's going into the soil. It, I mean, I, I of course in Tassie, blackberries were everywhere. Mm. I, find, I find lantana a, a, a really nice option compared to blackberries. <laughs> Not nearly as... No, they sort of break up and... I noticed you throwing some lantana seed around your garden before I joined <laughs> I'm on the side of the road. Trying to beautify your verge up there. Um, conscious of the time and also I want, let's get to the... While well, we're talking about sort of soil stability or, 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 or not or lack of, um, the floods of early last year, um, given your kind of the slope you're on and so on, I guess you still, you suffered it because you were underneath all that water, but that you, what was, what was the general impact on, on soil and the consequence of all that rain, you know, over that period of time, like immediately and then kind of long term, what was, what happened? Because it was quite a once in a lifetime event, wasn't it? Well, hopefully it's once in a lifetime. Mm. Uh, yeah, no, well, a, a whole lot of impacts. Um so the, on these steep slopes up here, as soon as you get rain and the right sort of rain, the volume of rain that we we got at eight eight hundred mils up in this valley up here over what like, period? Twenty four hours. Eight hundred mils in twenty four hours. Yeah. That is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. So it's a huge amount of water. This country, these soils are incredibly permeable. They're, they're, so 
you know, you can run a fire hose on these soils and you won't get runoff. But if you get get 800 mils it's in, go in 24 somewhere. hours, it's got to go somewhere. And it's even if it's get penetrating into soils, it's funneling somewhere and getting focused in somewhere. And and you know, below ground, of course, it all looks nice and flat and even on top of the ground. But below ground, you've got rocks. Um, you've got fissures and, and the, the water gets focused down these and then it comes out at the end of a fissure like a, like a, a, a fire hose and it just blasts a section out of the hill and once that section goes, the whole lot goes. So you get the big collapses in this sort of country and this country is not that prone to uh, landslip but we had a lot of landslip. It's steep, which is, of course is part of uh, what makes piece of land vulnerable if you've got steep slopes of course it's going to be more vulnerable but we had a lot of slips around here i mean that you would have driven past one i mean we were stuck behind a slip for a for a week here we didn't uh we didn't get into we didn't know how bad things were in lismore in town until uh we didn't have power here uh so yeah we didn't know how bad things were because we were stuck behind the slip we would still be behind the slip but a couple of the local boys have got um had some gear some earth moving equipment and some experience, ballers and, and um, guys that weren't, knew how to use equipment and they cleared the road. Or else we would have, you know, the council said, oh, we we haven't got any too gear. Much, too much. Oh, they well, they lost gear of... too. Yeah, right. So they were saying <laughs> we won't be out there for three months. So anyway, yeah, but this, you know, so within, you know, if you looked around here, within, um, uh, if you draw a radius of about a kilometre, you would have about four, five big slips, each of them a couple of hectares at least, and some of them four or five hectares. Um, and that, that, that's still having big impacts on we, my land care group. Did a, a check, had a look at the water down a little bit further on our creek, and um, the water quality is still pretty poor. The invertebrates, we did a, a check for invertebrates, and they were pretty... They were, they were absent, and um, the water looked okay, but you could see this slime. And I think because a lot of these slips actually went into the creek, and they're still feeding subsoil yeah. into the creek, that it's still working its way down through the system. A massive amount of sediment that went into this creek, but all the creeks, and, and we had, you know, some of the other creeks were, some of the other valleys were much more badly hit than us, Main Arm, and some of those places. Um, up closer to the uh, up to, closer to the park or closer to the upper Wilson, those sorts of areas were really badly hit up Mullum way. It's like an avalanche, wasn't it? I guess a couple of couple of hectares of 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 slip is that's yeah. a lot. That's like I don't know how many millions of tons of soil that would be. Oh, like, well, I think we had thousand. that that tiny slip which uh, closed the road. I think that um, I did a rough calculation, and I thought that we had probably had. Uh, something like uh, five thousand cubic meters of soil go into the creek, so not just from the slip, but actually went into the creek. Mm. Uh, it's a huge amount of sediment. But then, as you say, it's kind of slowly over time leached out and just gives a continuous. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Um, and then I guess every time there's impact. another big, another yeah. big water, you know, um, run of water through there, then there's another big chunk that probably gets sent yep. down the river. Yeah, yeah. Um, John. What else? Are, what else did I have for you? Um, I think that was pr- one other big impact. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. More was that. So I have been also really fortunate to spend time in the Pacific, um, looking at soils in the Pacific and understanding the, the complexity of their um, rotational gardening systems and how they have maintained productivity. You know that people call it slash and burn, but mm. you know that's a a disparaging way to look at what is quite a comp, a really complex gardening system where they clear an area, um, lots of organic matter that they put into the soil, burn it. Burning increases the pH of the soil. So these are tropical systems. So the soils are quite leached, and leaching leads to acidity. So burning it increases the pH to sufficient for them to grow their crops for a couple of years. Then the soil starts to leach again. The nutrients start to leach out, productivity starts to drop off, so they plant a few nut trees or whatever, bananas, 
some other species that might be tolerant of um, shading, so things uh, like um, carver uh, will go into the ground, cash crops, and then you know that, that then they keep moving, they move on, and then that area slowly regenerates, still providing product productivity, fruit and veggies, nuts for a while, and then game as, as the, the native forest comes back in. So it's still a productive area, and then they slowly work their way around and then come back after. So the rotation might be, you know, it's, and that rotation is strongly linked to how fertile the soil is, how quickly it comes back. So, you know, in some places the rotation might be 10 or 15 years, in other places it might be 40 years. They, they, they know their land very well. You know, this comes back to what we're talking about about this link to land and this understanding of land and being on land, you know, they've only been there in Vanuatu there for, you know, 2,000, 3,000 years. Um, But, you know, but that's a long time. How many generations is that? That's quite a few generations. And I think if you, I guess if you think of the First Nations people here, when you're looking at 60,000 years, that's a damn few generations. And, you know, and I, you know, if, I imagine if I was here for 60,000 years, I'd know a fair bit about it. You know, you've only been here for how long? You know, you know, <laughs> <a> lot of, <laughs> <laughs> that's right, 2,000 years. Um, it, it, I'm, I'm really pleased to hear that. Not that I'm too educated on kind of the process, but I mean, it sounds like it's kind of rotational permaculture in a way, isn't it? Or it food, is, food exactly. foresting or still, yep. uh, yep. um, what's the, um, uh, oh God! Um, yeah, no. Um, uh, silver past, you know. Um, uh, oh, yeah. The, agroecology. Agroecology. You know, there's another one. I'm missing it. It's um, bloody. It's in there. Yeah, like the stack. The, the stacking thing. Um, oh, on the tip of my tongue. Uh, yeah. There's another word for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just can't think of it now. That's a terrible mental blank. Yeah. So you got your understory, your mid story, and your top story, and then you're lopping, and it's all. Thing, you know, bunyard down at the farm yeah, of Byron yeah, Bay, there's yeah, a heap yeah, of it there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, what's it bloody called? Someone will yeah, give yeah. me a touch up about that. <laughs> John, it's an hour and fifty. I reckon we're going to wrap it up. What I what I'd like to do um, post this is um, you can you know have a stretch for a minute. I'll let you do that. I might drain the spuds and then I will. Um, we we'll just do a quick Q and A. Yeah, how's that sound? <laughs> Who's it's, asking the question? <laughs> <laughs> Me, of course. I've got the questions. Okay. And, they're, and they're sort of standard four or five questions that I ask every all my guests as a Q&A. And so this Q&A is available to our Patreon members. So anyone who's interested to be to hear what John actually answered of these questions, um, these poignant, very deep, deep <laughs> questions, um, you'll have to join um, and you won't regret it. Our Patreon community, on, uh, just go to charliearnett.com.au, $10 a month. This is the X-rated version. This is where, well, though I forgot to say that um, we have to get nude for this part. <laughs> well, and we, you, we, you we, we, leave the, we leave the video on. We leave you're, it on. You're right. You're like, you you turn people <laughs> off straight away. <laughs> um, I'm hoping that first, I'm hoping, well, we might check your phone and see that that video actually stayed on there. That it didn't, didn't, because it died. Oh, it no, it I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it'll stay there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. We'll yeah. check. We'll get your plug your phone and see what's happening. No, it's pretty standard questions. Um, and it's much shorter. It's sort of, you know, it's, um, it's what you want to do. You could say yes, no, or black or white. You know, it could be very short or you can embellish depending on how you're feeling. But, um, we'll wrap it up. Do I get the, marked on it? Uh, you will, yeah, there'll be a comparison to all our other guest answers there, which I'm putting into a book. Okay. What was John Grant's answers there? Um, so let's wrap it up there, John. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed that, and I knew this was going to be an enjoyable one because having having sort of seen you in, in – in, seen you perform, and it is a kind of a performance, and I say that in the nicest possible way when we, we were doing that three-day thing of – we nearly a couple, of, not quite two years ago now, yeah, with right, the yeah, yeah. with um uh with um Funny oh, link, yeah. that's right, yeah, 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 um with Rhino, um and um we uh and and his crew and we had lots of other contributors there. Um, it was like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday kind of thing at three different sites up in the Northern Rivers, and it was fascinating. I really enjoyed your, and that's why we're sitting here today because you made a real impression on me. Your the way you kind of we're describing soil and and making it fun. You're making it really, in, you know, like an interesting thing because I've listened to plenty of people talk about soil and it's dead shit boring. 
but the way you kind of made it relevant and the, your demonstrations, I, I love that. You know, when you squished, <laughs> squished it, you know, you squished it up into, you know, into a, you were squishing it up from, um, you yeah, add a bit of water yeah. and going, how, you know, how's that now? The, the, the completely dis- destruction of that of that structure was is like, oh yeah, that I is. I do that. I don't enjoy doing that. No, I know, I know. That's right. It was like I could see the pain as you were destroying uh, yeah, the structure yeah, of that yeah, handful. It was only a handful, but it was p- very painful. Yeah, that structure was taking some ten thousand years to form. That's right, and you just bugged it in. in, in yeah, in one minute, you just totally destroyed ten thousand years of, of of nature's work. Um, but it made a um, impression. So, John, thank you, um, and um, we'll we'll have we'll go for a break. Yes. And again, if you want to hear John's riveting answers, you'll just have to join Patreon for only ten dollars a month. There okay. you go. Yeah, you, you don't have to because you'll know the answers. But Thanks, well, John. I need to get the other answers so I can compare. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure yours are going to be the best. <laughs> And next week on The Regenerative Journey, my interview is with Jeff Ross from Lake Hawea Station in the South Island of New Zealand, uh, about an hour north of Queenstown. I was over there a couple of months ago, a few weeks ago now, first time in, in um, New Zealand. What a wonderful place. What a lovely fellow he is too, and his wife, um, Justine. They're a pretty awesome story they have. They're now farming, five years into their farming journey there, sheep uh, ecotourism, agritourism, all sorts of cool stuff. But you'll just have to listen to next week's episode with Jeff Ross on The Regenerative Journey to find out how cool that interview was. This podcast is produced by Reese Jones at Jaeger Media. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to subscribe, share, rate and review. For more episode information, please head over to www.charliearnett.com.au.